welcome back, dear adventurer. Today we will explore again the stories that shaped the world of Warcraft. We will delve the dank and dingy dungeons deep, where all the most interesting of stories sleep, and today you might well learn a thing or two about someone or somewhere you thought you knew. In today's episode, we turn our attention to a story of betrayal, and how such an honorless act can strip even the best of folk of their good heart and character. Ill fates can fall upon any of us, but it is in our response that our character is measured. To become the evil that once you've faced is a terrible end indeed, but sadly, this is what became of the stonemasons of Stormwind, the Defias. They will be our quarry for this next foray into Azeroth's dungeons, and quite fittingly we will find them hidden away in an old abandoned quarry. This quarry is known as the Dead Mines, and it has had a long history before its current use as a hideout for bandits. As far as our records can show us, it has always been known by the same name. Long ago, during the First War, the great hero Anduin Lothar entered the Deadmines to retrieve the Tome of Divinity from the clutches of a band of ogres that lived in its sprawling tunnels. The Tome of Divinity is an extremely important tome for the clerics of Northshire Abbey, as well as all paladins worldwide. It was through meditation on this book's teachings that paladins first learnt how to resurrect the dead. Also during the First War, the first Warchief of the Horde, Blackhand, had a disobedient daughter named Griselda who fled to the Deadmines with an ogre named Turok. She was subsequently slain by the Orcs for her insubordination, and one imagines a similar fate might well have met Turok too. Moonbrook, the town outside, was once the hub of commerce for all of Westfall, itself the breadbasket of the Kingdom of Stormwind, and a prized jewel in the crown of House Rin. Prior to the First War, the Dead Mines were considered the greatest source of gold in all the lands of the humans, so its value would be hard to overestimate. However, the entire town was razed to the ground by the Horde during the First War on their march to Stormwind. This march did not stop at Moonbrook though. No indeed, the Horde succeeded in toppling the towers of Stormwind, reducing the city to rubble, and snuffing out one of humanity's brightest candles. It took a monumental effort and nigh unimaginable resources for the stonemasons to rebuild Stormwind to the glory that it enjoys today. It took a legion of architects, engineers and artisans to craft a new capital that would not just mend what was broken, it would transform the great into the sublime. A mighty sculpture of white stone and the unbridled human spirit. It would show the world that the humans of Stormwind were not cowed by defeat and that they stood stronger than ever before, ready to reclaim all that was lost. The mastermind for this revolutionary project was one Edwin Van Cleef, the maverick leader of the Stonemasons Guild who matched his keen wits with the strength that only a lifetime of lugging masonry could achieve. When the restoration was complete, Edwin met with the nobles to collect their rightful payment. However, thanks to the meddling of one Lady Katrana Prestor, the nobles of Stormwind refused to honour the government's contract as previously agreed. Understandably, Edwin was enraged that the nobles would withhold payment for honest labour from their own subjects. After the economic devastation brought on by the war, the stonemasons of Stormwind could no more afford charity than they could an extra loaf of bread for the table. A hungry populace is a dangerous populace, as any ruling class should know. So the stonemasons rioted in the streets, in an event that would tragically result in the accidental death of Queen Tiffin Rin. With the death of his wife, King Varian cast the stonemasons out of the city, exiling them from ever seeing their greatest work again. In response, both as defiance of Stormwind and due to the harsh reality of having so many outlaw mouths to feed, Edwin formed the Defias Brotherhood, a large group of bandits, thieves and brigands. In truth, Katrana had played both sides and fanned the flames of conflict without arousing suspicion of her true intentions. To such a formidable being as her, subverting human affairs must have felt like child's play. But this was no mere game for the mortals on her chessboard. Moonbrook was rebuilt many years later after the Alliance was victorious in the Second War. It never regained the glory of its heyday, but isn't that ever the tale of lands ravaged by war? Its affiliation with the Alliance was short-lived however, as the Defias Brotherhood took over soon after the Third War, but I'm getting ahead of myself. The Defias established themselves and grew like a creeping mould all over the human lands, but Van Cleef himself was sequestered deep into the Deadmines, where he began work on the secret weapon of his revenge. 
The first notable challenge a Dungeoneer will meet here, after making mincemeat of the menials and miners mindlessly going on about their business, is a rather large and imposing ogre. Rap Zor is the foreman in charge of Edwin Van Cleef's construction projects. Surprising that a being of such dubious intellect is tasked with instructing others, however when one considers the mental faculties of the miners under his command, perhaps it makes sense after all. It's unknown whether he's from the ogre band that made its home here in the first war, but allegedly it's quite likely that he's the brains behind Van Cleef's secret weapon. And yes, I am serious. If so, it stands to reason he could have survived so long down here. Making yourself useful is a good way to stay alive among bandits. You often don't see him on his shift duty, as you can see here, but the recalcitrant Minor Johnson can sometimes be found here. He's just a working man of no particular significance, but I do recommend going out of your way to murder him if you can. Sometimes I wonder about the ethics of indiscriminate killing that we adventurers often engage in, but then I also remember the fat loot that we earn from it, and that really does soothe my worries. Next up is Sneed. Sneed is a lumbermaster and pilots a goblin shredder. They'll be needing a lot of lumber for their grand project, and who better to hire for the job than goblins? There are no workers in Azeroth more unscrupulous in their efficiency or as unbothered by environmental catastrophe as these green little blighters. Interestingly, while he's in his shredder, he has hair, but when he falls out, he's bald. I guess he must have bought the cheap brand of wig glue. Oh, anyway. Gilnid is the next challenge you'll have to face. A master smelter and crafter of automatons, which for the most part, don't spontaneously explode. He was cast out of Booty Bay for his insane experiments and for being too amoral, even for a goblin. Gilnid doesn't care for the Defias' mission, but they give him supplies and a place to work undisturbed, so he gives them weapons in return. Be mindful of his henchmen, however, as goblins are weak of will and quick to run like cowards. Slice their hamstrings if you can, or find some other way to slow them, unless you feel like facing a room full of compassionless murderers, both the machines and their makers alike. Ah, and here is the big reveal. Edwin Van Cleef's secret weapon. Once the doors to this underground grotto are blown away by a conveniently placed cannon, or once the lock is picked if you insist on a delicate touch, the crown jewel in Edwin's tiara is unveiled. This giant boat is actually a repurposed ogre juggernaut from the Second War era. Though they don't look it, ogres are actually master seafarers, and these things were monsters of destruction filled to the brim with such firepower so that almost nothing on the seas could withstand their assault. Raxor would have likely known the plans to build this monstrosity, Sneed would supply the lumber, and Gilnid would create the metal fittings and weaponry. It would be an impressive undertaking, were its consequences not so dire. Clearly Van Cleef plans to sail this warship to Stormwind and demand his rightful payment. If the nobles refused him again, he'd surely rain fiery doom and damnation on the city and reduce it back to the rubble that they built it up from, and there really is a sense of poetic justice in that. Mr. Smite is the first mate of the ship, under Captain Greenskin. He is one of the very few Tauren bosses that we ever face in the game, and a fan favourite to be sure, though never confirmed it's later implied that he survives this encounter and lives in exile in Pandaria. I guess we just didn't have the heart to kill such a fun chap. Captain Greenskin is the captain of this fine ship, though the quality of his crew is less than he might have been used to from his past with the Blackwater Raiders, Bloodsail Buccaneers, or frankly whatever other shady seafaring outfit his services were hired from. Unfortunately, he doesn't get to wear a pirate hat over here, at least not until the next expansion when he suddenly starts sporting one. Old habits die hard, I suppose. And finally, Edwin Van Cleef, cornerstone of the Stonemasons of Stormwind and now leader of the infamous Defias Brotherhood. The time for parley with this self-righteous bandit is long past. Whatever genuine debts he is still owed, he has extracted that value many times over in the spilt blood and misery of the innocent citizens of Stormwind's lands. Now you're here for his head, nothing more and nothing less. Be careful to drop him quickly though, as he'll be sure to try and fill your head with the fire's propaganda. None of us are truly happy with the nobility, this is true, but his menace has to be stopped. Two wrongs do not make a right, and Edwin lost count of his own ill deeds a very long time ago. Not to shake your resolve, but his daughter Vanessa will be watching. She will remember this moment well, and it will wither her heart black with the same furious revenge that filled her father. Isn't that always the curse of man? Endless feuds and retributions returned for eternity. But alas, we cannot fix the world, just rid it of yet another vengeful psychopath. 
On a slightly lighter note, it's more or less unknown how Cookie became the cook of this ship, but he is what he is and is harmless enough. He too survives this encounter to eventually become captain of the ship, or whatever remains of it. I suppose there aren't many left to oppose his claim, and it's probably better to leave this mess in the hands or flippers of a murloc than any brigand that might get some big ideas. Worry not about him though, and make your way back to the surface, through the secret tunnel exit. Never have the withered fields of Westfall been a fairer sight to behold. Bask in the warm sun that you'll meet there, for you will have definitely earned a moment's reprise in the sunshine. Thanks so much for watching. This video has been in the works for so many months now, and it's really a relief to finally upload it. I'd like to sincerely thank my patrons, both past and present, for your continued support throughout this most turbulent of years, and especially considering my lengthy absence from YouTube. This year has been really tough for all of us, myself included, but things are looking up for me at least right now, and I'll steadily be making videos again from now on. I'd like to also thank my friend Minoru for his help in making this video possible. His lore research was invaluable, and he also really helped me figure out how to make the visual part of this video work too. Please check out his dungeon lore companion, which I've linked in the description below. It inspired the script for this video, and can turn your dungeon runs into your own little Azerothian safari tour. Also linked in the description is obviously Patreon and PayPal, but more importantly my Discord, which uh, I'd really like to chat to some of you guys and catch up with you and how this year has been, and share some ideas I've got for the channel and just general life moving forward. Uh, but otherwise, I wish you all good health and good cheer, and until next time, stay chim.